I am here to talk to you about memory. In particular, memory hacking. So I am a psychological scientist. I am someone who actually spends her life, or at least her professional life, convincing people that they did things that never happened. So I create what are called false memories. So memories of things that aren't real. Um, I call this memory hacking because, well, I intentionally go into people's brains and I create memories or associations that didn't exist before. So a bit about me before I begin is, as I've just explained, I'm a memory scientist, so I do research in the lab, but I also work with military and police to train them on appropriate interrogation tactics, to talk to them about how memory works for really important life events like crimes. So how can we know whether an eyewitness is accurately remembering a crime? How do we know that a victim is accurately describing something that happened or a defendant is confessing to something that they actually did? And so I, I talk about this with military and police to get them up to date on the science behind understanding memory. So I'm going to give you guys a tiny insight, a tiny glimpse into this world that will hopefully be practical, that you can take home and use in ways that, well, hopefully aren't related to crimes as much, but are related to your own lives. So my favorite day of the year is April Fool's, the first of April. It's the one day of the year that everybody in the country is critical of new information. They're skeptical. They hear stuff and they go, oh, I don't know. Maybe that's not true. And I think that this is wonderful. And I wish that this critical thinking applied to our memories all the time. Because we often hear ourselves recall a story or family and friends recall a story. And we go, oh, wow, there's so much emotion. There's so much detail. There's so much complexity, it must be true. And we don't question them. And what I want to do today is I want to make you question every single one of your memories. I like to say, if I haven't given you an existential crisis by the end of my talk, I probably haven't done my job. So I want you to question whether you have a good memory, maybe you think you have a good memory, maybe you don't. You probably want a better memory, everybody does. I'm not the person to tell you the quick, hit, the quick, the quick fixes, the quick ways to improve your memory, the supplement to take. That's not me, that's other people. But for me, you're gonna hear how it works and how you can utilize things that are maybe already a bit broken and make them a little bit less broken. So I want you to picture something for me. So before we begin on the journey of understanding what memory actually is and how we can make the most of it, I want you to picture something. So I study what are called autobiographical memories, memories of our lives. So your first kiss, your first job, your first love, sort of the, the moments in our lives when we think back as opposed to facts or information, thinking about who we are, our identity. So what I want you to picture is I want you to picture waking up one day and not remembering any of your autobiographical memories. So you can't remember any of your childhood. You can't remember any of your family members. You can't remember any of your wonderful or negative experiences. Nothing. It's gone. Now the question is, is this person still you? And I think the answer for a lot of us, and we see this with patients with things like dementia, is that when you lose your autobiographical memories, arguably you lose yourself, because that's largely how we define ourselves. We define ourselves based on the kinds of things we've done in the past, which influences the kinds of things that we think we're capable of now and in the future. And so manipulating this and challenging it actually challenges our very sense of self, which is why, for me, the intersection that's the most interesting for memory is the intersection between identity and memory. How do our memories make us who we are, and should we rely on them as much as we do? So, what is a memory? You've heard today short-term and long-term memory mentioned a number of times. You've heard it mentioned as things that can improve your short-term memory. You've accurately heard short-term memory and working memory, for example, named in the same sentence, because they're very related concepts. The idea that sh there's this thing called short-term memory, which is really short, which is only about 30 seconds. 
and long-term memory, which is everything else. But what is a memory? How do you make a memory? What does it look like in the brain? And memory, in a very easy, very easy word, is a network. A memory is a network. And I could now go on to tell you how you have 100 billion neurons in the brain, so 100 million brain cells, and that these brain cells act like a galaxy that is constantly in motion, constantly changing, and that it's so infinitely complex that we'll never really be able to understand it. Or I could give you this diagram and say maybe in essence, it's actually not that complicated. And yeah, there's this beautiful cosmos analogy where things are constantly in motion and connecting to each other in beautiful ways, but really what you're looking at and what you're making and what you're accessing when you're talking about a memory is just a network of cells. And these cells are spread across the brain. You might have heard the word hippocampus in relation to memory. Sometimes, sometimes people say, memory is in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain, which is a small, small part of the brain, um, and it is important for memory, but the only role it really has is taking short-term memories and storing them until they become long-term memories. That's it. Everything else, the reason that when you recall a memory, you can hear things and feel things and smell things, you can describe what you saw, you can describe your thoughts, you can describe your emotions, are because all of those parts of the brain are activated when you activate a memory. And so that network is really important. But what else is important for false memories is that this network can change. Every time you recall a memory, you change its shape. In a way, which you may not be aware of, when you're accessing a memory for the second time, or the third time, or the fourth time, or the hundredth time, you're not accessing your original experience. You're accessing your last memory. Because what happens is that every time you make a memory, well, sure, you, you lay something into the brain, you make this network, but then every time you reactivate it, it becomes malleable. And then you reinforce some parts, and those go back in. And you lose some parts, and we call that forgetting, right? So you lose connect connections in this network, and that's forgetting pieces, forgetting details, forgetting that it was a Tuesday, maybe you thought it was a Thursday now. And then there's false pieces, which are bits that get added. Now, who can add pieces? Well. When we understand that memory isn't just a network, but it's also a social construction, this is where magic happens. This is where we really, truly begin to understand what memory is and how it can be influenced. Because I'm a social psychologist. I'm not a neuroscientist. I work with neuroscientists. But my intrigue doesn't lie on looking into the brain as much as trying to manipulate it just by talking to people. How can I get you to believe things just by trusting me and talking you through exercises? And we do this all the time. Every time you share a memory in a group, what happens? Well, for one, you're tailoring the story, you're tailoring the memory for your audience. You're telling them things that you think they're going to be interested in. Now, what happens when we do that? It means that we're reinforcing the most exciting bits, maybe even, sometimes, making them more exciting, so embellishing, adding, and we're leaving out things that we think might be boring to other people. On top of that, other people might share their version. Maybe we experienced something with somebody else. Maybe we went to a biohackers conference, and there were lots of other people, and we were there with our friends, and we later in the evening talk about this conference together. And we're sharing the experiences, sharing our memories, and what happens there is sometimes we steal other people's memories, we take pieces out of their brains and put them into our own. And in this, the term I like to use is that we are all memory thieves. We're constantly stealing pieces of memories from other people, and they're stealing pieces of ours. And this is why at family dinner sometimes there's debates where Uncle Jim is saying, no, but this happened, and your Auntie Sue is saying, yeah, but I remember it this way. Both people think they're right. Both people think their version is the correct one, but whose who's is right? Usually, in family situations, the one with the strongest voice or the person with the most confidence might be seen as right. But really what's happening is that one person, one or both accounts must be false, because if they're totally different, 
obviously they can't both represent what actually happened. So we're all memory thieves. We're all constantly stealing pieces of memories from other people and making them our own. And these stolen pieces feel like our own pieces because generally what also happens is we forget that maybe we were sharing a story with our friend and our friend rem reminded us or told us about something they experienced. Maybe we never experienced that thing at all. And the next time we tell it, we tell it as if it's our own. We forget that that source of that memory wasn't our own experience, it was somebody else's. I have an aunt, I have a good story for my aunt. Here's an extreme case of memory thievery. I, by the way, st I, I was a thief of this term. I didn't, I didn't coin the term memory thievery. It was a wonderful term that came out of a paper last year, which said that sometimes we also intentionally steal memories. So about a third of us will actually also say, well, yeah, I sometimes tell stories as if they're my own, knowing that they're not. But then the other question is, how often do you notice that someone is telling your stories without realizing, and you go, wait, that's, that was my experience, not yours. Um, but the memory thieves, my aunt. So, my aunt, oh, my mom was in a situation, not a good, a very highly emotional situation, a bad situation, where she was attacked in her car in Switzerland. So she was driving out of a parking garage with my father in the driver's seat, and there was a man who was blocking the exit. And he was clearly not quite with it, he was acting erratically, acting weird, and my mom gets out of the car in the still, in this sort of just with the door open and says, please, sir, could you leave? Could you move? We need to get out. What does the, the man do? He runs at her and starts punching her in the car. So my mom's in the car seat being punched. My dad doesn't know what to do. He drives. So he starts to drive. Dude's hanging out half. My mom's totally traumatized at this point, doesn't know what's going on. And they end up being okay. Everything's okay in the end. Two eyewitnesses, cyclists, just go away, don't intervene. Oh, um, but th it never gets resolved. They never find the people. But because it's such an emotional event and so complex and shook my mom's worldview so much, she told everybody. She told all of the family about this. And it was talked about a number of times. Now, my aunt, who the story was told to, a couple months later, said that she was in the back seat. Now, if you hear my aunt tell the story, it's as if she was there. It's as if she was experiencing it with all the emotion, all the complexity, as if she really was in the back seat, except that that's totally impossible because it happened in the wrong country at the wrong time, and she was definitely not there. But my aunt is 100% confident yeah, she was in the back seat. So she stole a memory and plunked herself into it and now tells it as her own. And this reality, she can't let go because it feels so real. And this is really important, I think, is that we're really bad at recognizing our own memories and we're really bad at being appropriately confident in our memories. Because true memories and false memories and edited memories and, well, not lies, but sometimes lies, can all feel exactly the same. And so we can't tell the difference. So true memories and fiction feel the same to us. And they feel the same to us because if you look in the brain, what else is a network? Imagined experiences. Imagination also can create these kinds of networks. And if you are told something with enough emotionality, enough complexity, that you can picture it really, really well, you can start to think that you experience it, and it becomes indistinguishable. It becomes impossible to tell the difference in the brain between something you heard or thought about and something you actually experienced. Here's a fun study. Would you recognize your own memories? Actually, there's two studies I want to talk about here. The first study has to do with a crime. So let's pretend that you are in a study, a research study. You come into my lab, and I show you a video of a crime. Now you know that you're going to be asked about this later, and I immediately afterwards say, here, pen and paper, write down everything you saw. Easy. Now, I send you away for a bit, an hour, a day, a week, depending on which condition you're in, you come back. I give you your statement back, except for some of you, I've changed small details, and for some of you, I've changed big details would you recognize that someone messed 
with your statement, with your memory. Now, it's easy to say, of course I'd recognize my own memory. Of course I'd recognize if someone intervened or changed my details. But the study clearly shows that most people didn't notice at all. Most people, especially for minor details, just went, yep, that's my statement. For major details, a significant, still about 30% went, yep, that's my, that's my statement. Didn't even think that there was something manipulated, even though it's a psychology study. Like, of all the times to be suspicious, a psychology study is probably a good place. And even there, they didn't notice. So a lot of the time, we don't notice when small details or even pretty big details have been changed. Now, this is really important, of course, for police questioning. But it's also really important for our own lives. Because again, it means that we don't detect that change over time. And so our memories can get increasingly further from reality. Another study. We'll get to the hacking, don't worry. You guys are like, but what do I do at home? We'll get to the challenging of reality and reinventing yourselves. We'll get there. Because um, you can totally use the science to essentially become whatever you want to be and decide your own past. We're getting there. Now, there's another recognition study that I really like. Because as I said, I really like the intersection of memories and identity. Now, one thing you probably think about when you think of who you are is your face. You think about what you look like. Right? So you're like, I am this person, and I look like this. But if I took a picture of you right now, and then I again sent you away for, let's say, an hour, in that hour, I photoshopped your face to either in 5% increments, to either be more attractive and to be less attractive. Now I print out these photos. I put them in front of you in random order. And I ask you, which one of these is your face? What do you think you're going to pick? So you're like, ha, ha, ha. You're probably right. Yes, you're going to pick a more attractive version than you actually are. Most of you are about 15% uglier than you think you are. So based on these kinds of studies, we've seen that most of us think, oh, that 15% enhanced photo, that's totally me. But why? Why do we have this? So some people, oh, narcissism. Oh, self-enhancement. Oh, we want to believe that, so it must, we think it's true. Maybe, but maybe it has something to do with memory. Because when you think about your face, what information are you relying on? I mean, sure, you're relying on maybe experiences in front of mirrors, where you're already maybe conscious of what you look like. But you're also basing it on all those Facebook photos and Twitter photos and framed photos that you have well, guess what? Which photos do you pick? Probably the ones where you look about 15% more attractive than you normally do. So you've hacked your own memory to, think, to make yourself think that you're more attractive than you actually are. Now, that's OK, though, because your friends and family generally pick the right photo. So they know what you look like, and they love you anyways. So other people know, but we've sort of manipulated our own memories in a way through social filtering and, and, and messing up our own stuff. So those photos, ah, maybe representative, maybe not, uh, but probably messing with your memories. So why? Why? Um, the biggest reason why these kinds of errors can happen are because imagination and memory are not totally different. That shouldn't be underlined. That's crossed out. <laughs> they can be easily mixed up. So as I said, the networks in the brain that are responsible for something that you imagined and something that you remember look identical. So if I put you in a neuroimaging scanner and I test a memory, I can't tell the difference between a real memory and a false memory or something you just imagined. Now, as a scientist, I like to talk about studies. So there'll be a couple more studies, including my favorite study. And then we'll talk about hacking. So, Again, we're sort of talking about hacking this whole time because we're messing with people's sense of reality and self. Tea with Prince Charles. So in terms of implanting false memories, researchers have done about 30, 35 years of research on this. So we've implanted, we've convinced people that they did things that never happened for quite a long time. We've just kept increasing what these memories were like. We've kept making them more difficult, more emotional, more important, more complex. One of the early studies uh, was actually about shaking hands with Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. So participants came in, and the researchers convinced them just by reading an advert 
It's by reading promotional material that was, that was fake, which described having an experience where you shook hands with the floppy-eared Bugs Bunny at Disneyland. Now, most of you, if you're up on your Disney, know that that's impossible because Bugs Bunny is not a Disney character. He's a Warner Brothers character. And so what initially seems like a totally plausible memory is totally impossible, and yet a significant minority, a bunch, a lot of people still said, oh yeah, I totally remember that experience, and here's what it was like. Just from a mere suggestion that this is something they experienced. So shaking hands with Bugs Bunny. But their critics said, well, but that's not totally impossible. It's, it's low stakes, can easily be manipulated. And so researchers said, okay, here's another impossible study, tea with Prince Charles. Now, I sometimes ask the audience who the character on the right is, but depending on my audience, I get things like the queen or other things that I don't necessarily like to hear, but it's Prince Charles. In the, in the UK, everybody gets it because of the big ears, apparently. Um, but tea with Prince Charles. So researchers convinced participants that they had had an experience where they had tea with Prince Charles when they were children. Again, most of us would probably argue that's impossible, and also, you couldn't convince me. And this is everyone's response to these studies. Not me. This wouldn't happen to me. Ooh, and that's, I think, why false memories, one of the reasons why false memories are so easy to implant is because we're not cautious. Anyways, so a significant minority again, so about 30% of the participants came to believe, yeah, I had tea with Prince Charles, here's what it looked like, here's what it felt like to be there, and here's why it happened. Now, here's my favorite of my own studies. A lot of the studies I talk about, by the way, are not mine. Uh, I talk about memory science research in general, rather than just my own research. It's the same in the book. So in my, I like to write books because I feel like it's like the best of like, you get to go through science and collect everyone's best studies and just put them all together. It's like an like a hit, all-hits record, but for science. Um, in my study, which went viral last year, I convinced people that they committed crimes that never happened. See, as I said, I train the military and I train the police. I'm actually a criminal psychologist, so I kind of go from psychological scientist to social scientist to criminal psychologist. Those are all true, but the application I most work with is the courts. And so there, again, we need to see, well, can we convince people that they did horrible things that they didn't? And yes, we can. So just by repeatedly getting people to picture committing a crime and them trusting me, thinking I had information about their lives from informants. These were university students. The informants were allegedly their parents. Their parents had told me this detailed situation where they had committed a crime and here's what happened, and here's why, and here's the police were involved, a theft, an assault, an assault with a weapon, and they were 13, 14 years old. And 70% of them, 70% of them, the overwhelming majority came to not just tell me, yeah, I think that happened, but again, here's how, and here's why, and here's what the police officers looked like. And I videotaped all of this, and then I showed it to other people and said, OK, so I've coded this, and these participants claim that these false memories of crime feel real to them. And now I'm going to show you guys videos of true and false memories from the same person, and you're going to tell me which is which. They couldn't do it either. So it looks like these false memories of high-stakes criminal situations look and feel real both to the people who are telling the stories and also to other people, which means it's all about prevention. We need to prevent. And the reason I do this study, sometimes people go, oh, but the ethics. That is an important question. But the ethics of this kind of work is, well, it's important that we show how easy it is, and it's important that we make it irrefutable for courts and the police so that they get better at using appropriate practices and not accidentally implanting false memories and maybe accidentally getting people to confess to crimes they didn't commit. Because you know what? That leads to wrongful convictions, and I don't want innocent people in jail. So I implant, using social situations and social techniques, persuasion, basic things like nodding, good, looks like it's really coming back. I implant false memories of crime. So that's sort of the pinnacle right now. That's the most extreme we've done in terms of memory hacking. 
And now you should be perceiving that existential crisis slowly. But if you can convince me of that, what else could you convince me of? And the answer is anything. And that's why it's so powerful. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. The other side of this, sometimes people ask me, well, why do you implant negative memories? Why don't you implant positive ones? Why don't you convince people for three weeks that they ran a marathon or that they were really intelligent or that they so somehow overcame some obstacle in an amazing way? Why don't you do that? That sounds much more ethical. And I go, I'm not sure about that. Because if I convince you for three weeks that you did something bad, and then in the debriefing I say, oh, just kidding, that didn't happen, you're relieved. You go, oh, thank God. But if I take away that marathon or that amazing thing you did, you're really disappointed, possibly. And so in terms of a study, there's some tricky waters there. Although there have been some false memory studies on implanting healthy food choices, which you guys might like. Now, I know my audience, healthy food choices. Um, we, we're, we're false memory researchers have convinced people that they, like Elizabeth Loftus, who actually just won a big award yesterday, um, that they had a really great experience with asparagus. Remember that time you loved asparagus? It was so amazing. And this actually can convince you to reach more for asparagus and eat more asparagus. And the opposite as well. People have been convinced that they had terrible experiences with strawberry ice cream or with certain kinds of yogurt or with chocolate cake. The idea being that if you implant bad memories of food experiences, people are going to eat those foods less often and maybe make healthier decisions. So in some ways, you can do this yourself as well. Because if you just repeatedly picture a negative or a positive event, it can start to become part of your reality. So how to hack your memory, what we're all here for. I needed to give you the foundation, because sometimes I feel like people jump right to the suggestions. They jump right to the, here's what to do, here's a checklist, take this home. I'm much more interested in giving you knowledge that you can transfer to any situation. When you understand memory is a network and these networks are malleable, when you understand, look, there's all these situations where we can manipulate memory and they look really real, you take that into the world and you know that for anything. If I just give you advice, that's not as useful. But now we've built up to the advice. So how to hack your memory? Well, for one, Potentially, we can delete and replace memories. So we know that we can implant them. We know that there's all these studies that have created memories, negative and positive. But for you at home, what you can do is you can potentially restructure how you think about events. So if you've got, this is sometimes the application that's talked about here, is PTSD, so post-traumatic stress. So if you've had something terrible happen in your life, how do we reformat that in a way that's less negative. And one of the applications that memory scientists are working on right now is taking away the emotion. Now, sometimes people say, oh, well, could you take away entire memories? Or like the eternal sunshine of a spotless mind. Could you take away memories of this ex that I don't want to remember anymore, of a person who's hurt me now and it makes me sad? And I go, probably not. Although I think there's someone talking about brain backups later. So we'll see his opinion on these things. Um, but probably not. So entire memories, because they're these giant networks all across the brain, are quite difficult to just take away in one go. But what you can do, and what researchers are doing, is they're taking away the emotion. Because there's nothing inherently negative to any situation. We can all experience a terrible event. And about 30% of us will have PTSD. 30% of us-ish will go on as if nothing happened, and 30% will actually experience post-traumatic growth. They'll say that they're better off after this terrible event, like losing their limbs. They've done these kinds of studies with amputees who've had accidents, and a third of amputees say, I'm now better off. Why? Because God smiles at me, or I now know who my friends are, or I know how to overcome adversity, I know myself, but whatever. There's lots of reasons. Luckily, humans are resilient creatures. But for some people, sometimes we want to get rid of the emotion, the sadness, the anger, the trauma. But we don't need to forget the whole thing. We just need to get rid of the emotion. And right now, there's some studies with rats as well, where they're actually going right into the brain and cutting out 
just the emotion. So lots of potential research and lots of potential applications. And for you at home, what you can do is think about negative events and maybe think about alternate versions of them. Maybe interpret it slightly differently, interpret it slightly better. This is also generally what happens normally when we start to get over something. It dampens, the emotion goes away. But you can take control of that to some degree. So delete and replace memories. My favorite thing to do is to pick a past. Why? Uh, my, my quote here is, live in the present because the past is mostly fiction. When you realize that, well, no memory is safe from corruption, no matter how real it feels, no matter how emotional it is or complex it is, it might still be a false memory, then you realize that, well, what is this thing that I call my own past? And should I really place, place much importance on it? Is it really that important, especially negative things? And it really, I think, frees you to say, actually, most of this, it's tainted anyways. It's biased. So why don't I just focus on the present and the future and let go of the past because it's mostly fiction anyways? So pick a past. What else can we do? We can also, ooh, change our identities. Maybe you want to be somebody else. Maybe there's a part of you that you don't like or you want to be more confident, you want to be happier, you, whatever. Again, if you repeatedly picture events as they could be, repeatedly picture experience that you would like to have had, ex picture what essentially a background and identity situations in ways that you would like them to happen, they start to inform your brain and they start to become parts of networks and slowly creep their way into your, into your reality. So potentially you can pick an identity. It sounds a bit sci-fi and it sort of is, but all of this also gets very into the, the question of what is real. The only thing that's real is your perception and your thoughts right now. Everything else, everybody has their own reality in this, in this, in this room right now. Same thing with neuroplasticity. Sometimes we talk about neuroplasticity, which you guys know, right? The flexibility of the brain as this wonderful thing that we all need to do lots of. Well, yeah, we're doing it right now. If your brain wasn't plastic, if it wasn't flexible, you, we couldn't be having, you wouldn't remember any of what I just taught you, and you wouldn't be able to think. So neuroplasticity is something we all have, luckily, all the time. But pick an identity, decide who you want to be. Um, again, playing with that idea of networks and how you can remember differently. What else? Make a giant memory trace. You know that memory is a network. Multi-sensory memories stick better. When you talk to memory grandmasters, people who are amazing at remembering stuff, what they tell you is to think in pictures. They tell you to think in 3D objects you can interact with. You're trying to remember maybe even an emotional experience, an experience where you're on vacation. You're like, I want to remember this moment forever. Think about this. Think about every piece of what, what's going on right now. What am I feeling? What am I seeing? What am I hearing? Make a network that's as big as possible because it doesn't make it safe from corruption, but it makes it more likely you're going to find it at all. So you want to make a big complex memory and that makes it much easier to remember stuff. And from the best memorizers in the world, they use the same approach of making a big complex trace with lots of different senses. Another thing I like to suggest, I know some of you are more fans of this than others, use social media. Why? Because if you're live tweeting something, for example, you're making a record outside of your brain that isn't prone to the same social influences as your brain is. Still prone to social influences, of course, but not the same ones. And you can go back and check. You can go back and say, oh, that's what I actually thought at the time. That's what I actually said. So writing stuff down, which takes me here, not just tweeting it, not just taking pictures, but also writing stuff down in general because we're really bad <laughs> at estimating how likely we are to remember something in the future. It's called prospective memory. It's the, I'll remember that, I don't need to write it down. I feel like most of us do this almost every day. I'll remember to cancel that subscription. I'll remember that quote, whatever. And most of us forget. And this is what subscription services are based on, the free trials. They bank on the fact that we're going to forget to cancel. So write it down. We're, really bad. We have overconfidence in our ability to remember things in the future. And finally, be consistent. So when you tell a story, be careful not to embellish, not to guess. 
Because when you tell a story and you start going, well, maybe this happened, and perhaps this happened, and I could imagine logically that this would be the conclusion, the next time you tell the story, you might forget the maybe, the perhaps, and it just becomes the story because your imagination takes over. So I'm going to leave you with this. What I want you to be is cautious, curious, and kind. Be cautious where your memories are from and whether or not they're accurate. Be curious where other people's memories are from. That memory that doesn't sound quite right, maybe you can double check or look for independent evidence somewhere on the internet. Maybe there's pictures that you can check and see, oh, maybe that is or isn't right. And be kind. Just because someone's saying something that you know is not true, it doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. They might just be misremembering. And that's all I have for you. So thank you. Yes, any questions? Thank you, that was fabulous. Is it possible that uh, some of these personality disorders, like a narcissistic personality disorder, if you spend a lot of time with somebody as I have that has that, there's a lot of this you know, creating their own you know, creating their own identity mm -hmm. and a lot of embellishment that just takes place in it. And I've noticed, and this is just purely observational, but I've noticed that there's a real tendency here for you know, this disorder to, for people to, it, it feels like it's a memory disorder because they believe it. they're, you know, recounting things and pro projecting a self that is genuinely believed. Is, is, it, is it possible that it's a memory disorder, th those types of personality disorders? I don't know if that's even something that's been studied. It's a good question. Um, I, I don't know is the answer. If narcissist, I've never heard that narcissism is a, is, is a um, memory disorder. I mean, there's also a difference still. I mean, obviously, memory and perception are linked. But you can also just perceive things wrong. So one person who's looking at a presentation goes, oh my god, that was amazing. Or maybe looking at themselves in the mirror goes, oh my god, you look amazing. And another person looking at the same thing in the mirror might perceive it in the moment totally differently. Um, so I think that it might be more of a perceptual tilt, a bias in perception than it is a memory thing. Um, but certainly, if you're narcissistic, I mean, generally, we remember things better that are important to us as well and that we pay a lot of attention to. And if you pay a lot of attention to yourself, and you're your most important, I mean, we're all our favorite protagonist, but if, you're, if you pay a lot extra attention, let's say, then you are going to have better memories as well of yourself, uh, and they're going to be tainted probably by your perception as well. So, um, but again, every, all of us can have false memories. Um, but you're right, personality might affect how we potentially distort memories. Um, I have a question. Uh, this might sound ridiculous, but uh, this the same concept also occurs in visual memories. For example, um, if you're a dancer and then you uh, fancy this one dancer and then you always see how she performs, how she moves, so you, Im can you sort of like imagine yourself moving as if you're doing her moves and it becomes in your memory and w you will be able to move like this, the same way, for example. So this is essentially a coaching question that you're asking. Um, and I do regularly get emails from sports coaches who say, ooh, this is kind of like visualization. This is kind of like what we do when we get people to practice, mentally rehearse exercises. And it is. It's exactly what it's like. So it, by repeatedly picturing something, it might make it easier to actually execute it. That being said, I don't know of any literature myself that actually supports that beyond what coaches say that they do. Theoretically, it makes sense that there should be some sort of correlation. In practice, I don't know. Thanks for that. That was really interesting, the work you do. Really amazing. Um, I was wondering about dreams. Um, okay. I don't know if you've worked with it, um, but for example, in the morning, if you remember a dream, is it a momentarily memory? Like, did you even dream it, or are you just at that moment imagining a dream that you might have had? 
There's always a dream question. Dreams are fascinating because scientists still have no idea why we dream. Uh, like, no clue. We know that we need to, and we know what they kind of look like in the brain, and we know how much we need, but that's it. Um, so, and it seems to be a replay. So, general, so, so what we dream about, often you can actually see a neural path, so a, a pathway in the brain, a network, one of these networks in the brain, being reactivated in like extra fast time. So what we say from memory, that sleep is really important for consolidation, for making a memory stick. But beyond that, in terms of, it, but technically making new memories is supposed to be turned off, right? You're not supposed to remember your dreams. That's essentially a, a broken process, although some of us do. Um, but I, I don't know in terms of, it, it, it would become a memory and it can distort your reality, uh, just like any other memory potentially. Um, but again, it's technically a, the process failing <laughs> because you're not supposed to remember that because otherwise we'd constantly be confused between things that we've just dreamt and things that we've experienced. So sleep. I think the, the biggest advice that I can give you for memory is sleep. You need sleep. All right. We have, yes. Thank you. I'm a psychologist and I have a friend who has experienced severe trauma, physical mm -hmm. abuse throughout her childhood, and she's still reliving that mm -hmm. and feeling so much emotion. She's overwhelmed. Could you say a little bit more about how to take out the emotion? Because she's a very emotional, passionate person, and it, it, it seems very difficult for her to do, but she's trying to overcome that and move forward. So I'm going to preface this with I'm not an expert on trauma. Um, I do generally implant them rather than take them out. I just work with some people who do take them out. Um, we're very early stages with regards to removing traumatic memories. Um, but from therapy, I mean, what you're often trying to do is restructure how we think about it. Again, trying to work, lessen that emotionality. How you do that, generally, repeatedly trying to have positive experiences with those memories. So trying to, which can be incredibly difficult because they're so linked, especially when they're um, strong and repeatedly recalled already. Because, um, I mean, the biggest thing with, with memory isn't necessarily forgetting. The more important thing is sometimes we remember things that get in the way that we, that we want to forget, that we need to forget. So difficult, but over time, that should weaken, especially if the therapist... So what, I think the worst case scenario here is if a therapist says, keep reliving it, you need to experience all this emotionality. I think a better approach is saying, okay, let's, let's reconfigure, let's think about the good things. Maybe you learned something, anything about humanness out of this, and it made you stronger. And focusing on that, and then slowly taking out that emotion. So I think the idea that we need to constantly relive negative things is not quite right, because it just strengthens the negative bits. Not All sure right. <laughs> How about a big hand for Julia Shaw? That was a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you. Now, who would like to memorize that talk? <laughs> Yes? Well, actually, the reason I'm saying is that the next speaker we have, he's going to actually, the professor is going to explain how you can back up your brain.